What can you do when you have a spouse who wants out of the marriage and now they won't even talk to you? Or maybe your spouse doesn't want out of the marriage, but you're stuck living with a spouse who won't open up to you and won't talk to you, and it's basically like you're not married at all. My name is Kimberly Holmes, and I'm the CEO at Marriage Helper, and we recently did this topic on one of our webinars, and people found it extremely informative, extremely helpful to help them in what they were going through with their own marriage. And so this is going to be a little bit different than our normal podcast format that we typically do, but in the next 60 minutes, you're going to be able to listen in on that webinar. And we're going to be teaching you the three steps that you can take to talk to your spouse and to get your spouse to open up and to respond to you, no matter what situation your marriage may be in right now. In the first 40 to 45 minutes of this, you'll hear me going through this three-step process. And then towards the end, you'll hear me start taking question and answers. We hope that it truly helps you to be able to speak to your spouse, to be able to approach your spouse, and to give you the confidence that you need to talk to your spouse and make a huge difference in your marriage. I know it's going to be really helpful. So here it is, the webinar on the three steps to talking to your spouse. The thing is that it can be so frustrating when we're wanting to work on our marriage, but our spouse has absolutely no desire to talk to us. And this is true in situations where either your spouse wants completely out of the marriage and so they won't talk to you because they want nothing to do with you, which is a pretty extreme case. But I know it's a case that a lot of people watching this video and this webinar are struggling with. And we do have a way to help you with that. We have a way that has worked for hundreds and thousands of people that has helped them to re-engage with their spouse that we're going to be talking about. But some of you might be listening to the webinar or watching this video at a later time, and you're thinking, well, I, it's not that extreme. I mean, my spouse still lives with me. We still have some kind of communication, but I just can't get my spouse to open up about anything. Because every time we talk or every time we try to have a conversation, we just fight or we don't even get that far. I'll try to talk to my spouse and they just shut me down. They shut me out. There's some kind of wall that I feel like I can't get past. And it's no matter where you are on that spectrum, it's incredibly frustrating because you want so badly to connect with your spouse because you feel like if you could just say the right thing, that it would make everything better. Or you feel like if you could just use the right words or make sure that they understand something that you're feeling that everything would change and you wouldn't have the problems that you're having. Or if you could say the right thing or make your spouse see that you're doing something differently that maybe they wouldn't be leaving. Maybe you could just say something and it would bring them back. Unfortunately, I don't have one phrase that you can say to your spouse and it would bring them back. And I know that there's other people who advertise that and who guarantee that certain words or certain phrases are just guaranteed to bring your spouse back. But the truth of the matter is when we look at the social sciences, when we look at the tens of thousands of marriages that we've worked with at Marriage Helper, there's not one certain phrase and there shouldn't be. Because no matter where your marriage is, it's going to be different. Everyone's situation is different. So what we have found is that the best way to do this is to teach principles and to teach things that you can learn from and you can implement in whatever situation your marriage might be in. And this works in any different situation. So you take it, you apply it, and that is what gets that conversation going no matter what situation your marriage is in. Even if it's extremely hopeless and it feels absolutely like there's nothing you can do to make it better. Or if you're still in the same house, you're still committed to staying in this marriage, but things are just miserable right now because you can't talk. These three steps that I'm about to teach you will help no matter which situation you're in. I'm going to try and um, and share my screen so y'all can see the PowerPoint that, that we kind of have for this. But Um, You'll also get copies of this in your in the emails that you get after this, if that's something that would be helpful to you. 
So here we go. Okay, so the first step that we're going to be talking about how to get your spouse to start talking to you is the first one is figure out the why. Like I was just talking about just a minute ago, there's many different situations that could be happening that your spouse has disengaged with you. And if we don't know exactly why our spouse has disengaged with us, then we could be like we're trying to chase a rabbit that is not even there. It could be that we're trying to fix something and we're trying to go about it the wrong way because we don't know the actual stem of the problem. It's like if I were to hurt my foot and I'm walking around and I'm limping and I don't know exactly what I did to hurt my foot. So maybe I just take some ibuprofen because I think, well, you know, maybe I just stepped on something wrong. And so that must be what's going on. So I'm just going to take some ibuprofen and, and that'll make it better. But if I don't have inflammation in my foot, if in fact, maybe I, I stepped on a, a, a pine cone needle and it went up into my foot and it's getting infected, then no amount of ibuprofen I take is going to stop that infection. I have to go in and I have to find that pine cone, the, the, those pointy things that are on the pine cones, and it has to be removed. That actually happened to me when I was younger. Y'all might be thinking, what a strange example. But that actually happened to me when I was younger. I'll never forget. I was playing outside in my driveway and I was, I was like seven or eight years old. And, um, and I was just playing outside barefoot and I got one of those things stuck in the bottom of my foot. And for days I went and I, I kept walking on my foot and it just kept hurting and I didn't know why. And I had to end up going to the ER because the infection got so bad that it was starting to spread inside my entire foot, but I didn't know where it was coming from at first. And so what we want to do is we want to figure out where is the issue coming from? Because if we, if we are attributing it to something, but it's actually coming from something else, then we're going to keep fixing a problem. That's not a problem while the actual problem keeps getting worse. So why is your spouse not talking? Why have they disengaged? One possibility, and I'm going to go through three possibilities. There could be more, but these are the top three that we've seen and that I've even seen in my own marriage. The first one is there could be personal issues going on with your spouse. I know that when, when my marriage was going through its hardest time, my husband was going through personal issues that I wasn't even completely aware about. There were some issues at work that were happening, and I knew that there were issues at work, but I didn't realize just how much it was affecting him. And so in the anger that he was having because he didn't feel respected at work and, and things weren't going well and he wasn't advancing the way that he was hoping to, it affected the way that he felt about himself. And he was so sensitive to everything that was happening with him personally. He just felt like things were kind of crashing down around him that he just disengaged from the relationship too. Now there were things that I would do to try and get him to engage that did not make the, that did not make the situation better. And we're going to talk about that in step two, but I would, I kept thinking there's something wrong with me. There's, he doesn't love me anymore. He's mad at me about something. And I was constantly thinking, what have I done? What have I done? What have I done? When in reality, for that situation, it wasn't anything I did. It was something going on with him personally that he didn't feel open enough to talk to me about. And the fact that I kept pushing him and pushing him and pushing him, it didn't make it didn't make him want to open up either. So there might be a personal issue going on. We did a podcast back in December on defining a midlife crisis because so many people, when they come to us at Marriage Helper, they say, well, I think my spouse is just going through a midlife crisis and that's why they've completely disengaged and that's why they're not talking to me anymore. And when you look at the research, there's no such thing as a midlife crisis. We use that as a term to try and kind of put people into a bucket of things where we don't really know what's wrong with them. So we're just going to label it as a midlife crisis, even though that's, there's no clinical diagnosis for that. But when we start looking at what people are going through in a midlife crisis, and I encourage you to go back and listen to this podcast, you can find it on iTunes or on Google play. It's the one about midlife crisis, but you can find it under marriage radio. That's the name of our podcast. But when you look at why people are having a quote unquote midlife crisis, a lot of times it's because 
they feel a loss of something in their life. Maybe it's a loss of an actual person. Maybe they lost a parent or they lost a loved one, or maybe it's a loss of a dream that they had for their life, that they had a dream of becoming an entrepreneur or getting that promotion or buying that house or something that they just always thought that they would achieve one day and then they didn't or they haven't yet. And so because of that, they're experiencing something very similar to a grief process. And in that grief process, people can disconnect. People can stop wanting to engage even with the people closest to them because they don't really even know how to get through what they're going through right now. So there's many different personal issues that can come that could get your spouse to disconnect and to not talk. And another one definitely could be relationship issues. We see many times at Marriage Helper that control is one of the deadliest silent killers of a marriage. And when people hear the word control, some of them might think, oh, that's a really strong term. I don't know that that I would say that I feel controlled in my marriage. But when we start looking at the definition of control, which we've done many podcasts again on marriage radio about, but when people feel controlled, they basically feel like they are treated as not as an equal with their spouse, that they're being treated less than, and maybe they're being treated like a child and everything that they are saying, their spouse is saying back to them, no, you don't feel that way. No, you don't think that. At some of the workshops that we do, actually in every workshop that we do, we have many couples, if not all of them, where they realize that control is one of the biggest issues in their marriage. And a lot of times this is, this is what, It looks like coming in, someone might say, well, you know, I just I feel like I can't say what I feel. I feel like if I were to say I voted for this person or I like this football team that my spouse, the only thing they say back to me is that's stupid. Why do you feel that way that you shouldn't feel that way? You should vote for this person or you should like this sports team. And a lot of times we don't mean to be controlling towards our spouse, but many times that's the way that it can come about. I mentioned earlier that, you know, in the personal issues, that's something that have, has definitely manifested itself in my own marriage and caused disconnect in the past. But another one has been, I definitely at the beginning of our marriage, I was very controlling. When my husband would come home from work and we had just, you know, gotten married. So we were trying to figure out how to live like this. And when he would come home from work, I started saying everything he needed to do. You need to do this. You need to do that. Even as he was telling me about his work day, you didn't handle that right. I need to tell you how to handle that because you're doing it wrong. And basically what I was saying is I know better than you. And so if you're not going to listen to me, then I'm just going to make your life even more difficult because then I'm going to tell you about how you should have listened to me. And he didn't feel like an equal. We weren't treating each other as equals. And so it led to some of this disconnect that even caused him when he was going through the personal issues to not want to open up. Why would I tell you about what I'm struggling with at work? Because you're just going to tell me how I'm doing it wrong, how I need to do it different, how I need to do it better. You don't accept me for the person that I am. And so I'm just not going to talk to you about it. Something I experienced, something I had to overcome. And I'm going to show you how I overcame it in steps two and three, but relationship issues are a huge one. It could be that you've, have been controlling without realizing it, which there is help and there is hope for changing behaviors, even though it's really hard to do that. I know I've had to do it myself, but there's also, if you've been controlled in your marriage, then if it could be that if you've been the person who's been controlled and you're not doing the things that your spouse is trying to get you to do, that they have stopped talking to you because you're not listening to them. And that's difficult too, but we're going to show you even then what you can do. It could be many other types of relationship issues where there's just constant fighting. Maybe there's something we call the four horsemen where every time you talk there's, or you try to solve an issue, you use these four horsemen, which completely can, which continue to keep the cycle of conflict going. Things like being really defensive or blaming your spouse for everything or rolling your eyes or, calling your spouse names, doing different things like that, which just have led to an environment where in your relationship, you feel like you can't talk. 
because it's always, it always ends in fights. There's always a cycle that's going on and you just can't seem to get past that. If that's the issue, it's good to know that it's a relationship issue going on and there could be an external issue. And what I mean when I'm talking about external issues is there could be something like an affair going on. That's what we would put under an external issue. It could be under relationship issues, but I decided to, for sake of clarity, to keep relationship issues as an issue in between the husband and the wife, just between their personal relationship. And then an external issue being things like an addiction or being things like an affair, things that are not personal because it's not something that they're um, like grief or something like something going on at work, but an external issue such as an affair, such as an addiction, things that we see also see very often at marriage help. So when you start looking at this, figure out the why. Is it an external issue? Is my husband dealing with addiction? Is my spouse, is the reason that they're not talking to me because they're in love with someone else? Is it because they're, that's why they want out of the marriage and they feel guilty or they feel angry or they've rewritten history in such a way where they just don't want to talk to me? That's the external issue going on. I think we think we have a good understanding of that. So some questions to ask is, is there something else going on in my spouse's life? Maybe I don't know this for sure, but I think as spouses, a lot of times we can kind of sense that there's something going on that our spouse isn't telling us about. That doesn't mean you should go and be paranoid because that's the last thing we want. But we can sense things when our spouse might be hiding things from us. So just, is there something else that might be going on in my spouse's life that I don't know about? Is there a marriage issue going on? Is there something that perhaps I have done that has led to my spouse shutting down and not wanting to talk to me? Have I caused my spouse to stop talking in something that I've done? And we're going to talk more about that in step two. So for step one, we want to identify what the core issue is. What, why have they stopped talking? And then in step two, we want to stop what we call the push behaviors. These push behaviors are things like begging, pleading, whining. We'll never forget one time we had a couple come to our workshop and she said, when I figured out that he wanted out of the marriage, I did everything I could to try and keep him there. I, he, whenever he wanted to physically leave, I would take his car keys. I would cry. I would bang my head on the floor. I would throw a fit because I just knew that if he could see how much I was hurting, that he wouldn't want to leave anymore, that he would stay. But what we see happening is while that's our human nature to, if I can just do enough to see, to make you see how much this hurts me, then maybe out of your human empathy and compassion, you will stop. That's what we hope will happen, but that's not what happens. In fact, the exact opposite happens. When we start trying to push our spouse to stay with us, it just pushes them further away. So when we do things like the begging or the pleading or the whining, please talk to me. Why won't you talk to me? Questions like that actually aren't going to get your spouse to open up to you. They're just going to push your spouse further away because if they do open up when you're this emotional, they don't know what might happen next. So don't beg and plead and whine. Don't try and, put, don't try and push your spouse to talk. If you just keep bombarding your spouse with questions, it's definitely not going to get them to open up. It might get them to open up in yelling, it might get them to give some kind of verbal response where they just yell for you to stop pushing them or they yell for you to stop with the questions. But it's not going to get you the kind of conversation that you're looking for. Don't try to continue to contact your spouse if they're not responding to you. This is something, again, that goes against our human nature. But one of the things that some people have told us when they have uh, joined for example, our online course, which is called the Save My Marriage course, they, they say that, well, other programs that I went through before this one, they told me that I needed to contact my spouse every single day because I need to stay at the forefront of my spouse's mind so that maybe one day they'll, they'll wake up and they'll read that text message or listen to that voicemail or read that email and they'll just realize everything that they've missed. 
And while in theory, that would be really great, and that sounds really wonderful, it doesn't work out that way. No, in fact, the way that we've seen it with, again, tens and thousands of people is the more we try and push our way into our spouse, the forefront of our spouse's mind, especially if they're trying to um, get away from us, it just continues to push them further away. So instead, what we promote at Marriage Helper is something called smart contact. We don't say that you should have no contact with your spouse because that's also not what we want. Keeping contact with your spouse is important, but we want to do it in a way that your spouse is engaging back with it. I know many of you have probably uh, been in maybe stores where you're around and you're just looking, you're just trying to shop, but there's someone who just keeps coming up to you and saying, is there anything I can help you with? What can I do for you? Or maybe you're on a mailing list or you keep getting telemarketer calls from people who are just saying, you know, do this. I want you to do this. And they just keep contacting you. And the more they keep contacting you, the more you're like, you know what? I don't want to hear from you again at all. You've just made me mad. And that's not what we want to do with our spouses. Instead, we want to use smart contact where we have an article about that that I'm going to email out to all of you after the webinar. But if you go on our website, marriagehelper.com, you search the phrase smart contact, you'll find the article there as well. And under smart contact, we say, find the opportunities that there are to connect with your spouse. This is really easy or a lot easier if you have children together because you at least have something that gives you a reason to continue talking to each other. You know, uh, little Shelly did great in her t-ball game today. Here's a picture of what happened. You're giving your spouse information that is relevant, something they would probably care about, but you're also keeping in touch with them. Maybe it's something if you own a business together. We have a lot of people actually who own businesses together with their spouse. And so if there's things like that that keep you in touch with each other, don't cut those ropes, as we say. Anything that gives you a reason to continue talking to your spouse, including them staying at home with you, which is very important. Those are important things to keep there. You don't want to cut the ropes that keep the communication going with your spouse. You want to keep those things, but you don't want to push your spouse to talk to you either. It's very much an art and not a science of, and there might be trial and error that comes with this, but one of the things we've seen and one of the reasons that, that many people uh, or many counselors refer people to us is because we teach things different than what counselors or therapists might teach because we have actually, we're specialized in this niche, so to say. We're very specialized in working with people who their marriage seems completely far gone or the situation that they're living in at home is just completely miserable and they don't know how to move forward from it. And these are things that we are teaching you in this push behaviors and in the things that we offer at Marriage Helper in our online courses and our workshops and different things like that. Um, infinite smart contact, which we talked about. So the first one, the step one is we want to figure out the why. Why is my spouse not talking to me? Have I done something that's led my spouse to feel like they can't open up to me? And then the step two, or is there something else going on in my spouse's life that has stopped them from opening up to me for whatever reason? Maybe it's an affair. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's something going on at work or a loss of something in their life, or maybe it is a relationship issue. And it very well could be that it is a combination of many of these things. And then the second one, to stop the push behaviors. Don't beg, don't plead, don't whine. Don't try and push your spouse to talk and implement smart contact. Step three of this is to focus on the friendship. So we figured out the reason, or at least a combination of reasons, we figured out what the what the issue is in the marriage enough that we say, OK, I, I have an idea of what's going on. I know that it's a combination of I haven't allowed my spouse to open up to me because every time they tried to they tried to in the past, I probably made them feel controlled, even though that wasn't what I intended to do. But that paired with the fact that my spouse maybe is in an affair has just really quadrupled their determination to not talk to me. So what we can't control is the fact that our spouse might be in an affair. 
These external issues are things that you and I can't control. We can't control if there's something going on with our wives or our husbands at work. We can't control if they lost a loved one. We can't control if they're struggling with depression or a mental illness. We can't control those things. The things that you and I can control are things that we have a direct impact with our spouse to do. So anything that we have done that might have caused a relationship issue, we can control that. We can also control the way that we we react to our spouse, regardless of the way that they react to us. And thirdly, we can control how often we contact our spouse and the types of things we talk about when we talk to our spouse. A lot of times I know I felt this way when I thought that my marriage was headed for divorce. And even if it wasn't going to divorce, we were going to be completely miserable was I felt like there was such a burden on my shoulders to save the marriage. There was such a burden on my shoulders. I wanted everything back from the intimacy to the great communication to being able to eat dinner together. I wanted all of that back at one time. And it felt like a burden that was impossible to get to. So one of the things that we teach in our Save My Marriage course is to break things down into baby steps. Because when you put a lot of weight on your shoulders to do one thing, it can cause paralysis by analysis, as we like to say. Paralysis by analysis of, okay, there's so much that I need to do and there's so much that needs to change. I don't even know where to start. So I'm just not going to do anything because it's too overwhelming. And what we do in things like this and in our Save My Marriage course where you get 10 weeks of of guidance and figuring out a plan and that step by step, the baby steps to take and also the support that you get with um, with the group in there. What we focus on doing is breaking that down. But one of the first things that you need to do is focus on friendship. Think back to when you first started dating your spouse and how your relationship progressed from there. Many times when we fall in love, we have something I don't at marriage helper called the love path. And I don't have a visual representation of it ready, but it's a four stage process of how people fall in love. And we, this is research documented. This is things that have been proven in the lives of tens of thousands of people. And the truth of the matter is any two people can fall in love. Any two people can as long as they have a right to each other and they follow this certain path that we call the love path, any two people can fall in love. And it starts with attraction and it goes to acceptance and attachment and then aspiration, which the last two we're not even going to worry about right now because we're focusing on the beginning, but any two people can fall in love. It's staying in love that we tend to struggle with because once we fall in love with someone, it's like, I got them. We're married. Things are great. Now we're just going to put our relationship on cruise control and I'm going to stop doing the things that caused us to fall in love in the first place. I remember when my husband and I were dating when we first started dating and how he came and he picked me up at my dorm room in college so many years ago. And he took me, he opened all of my doors and he took me to the Cheesecake Factory where I dropped my dinner in my lap in the middle of our first date, which was completely humiliating. But we talked about a lot of things, just asking questions like, so where did you grow up? Where did you go to school? What, what did you study when you were in college? What did you do last weekend? Very much questions that didn't really have feelings associated with them because he and I were not there yet, but just very much trying to learn facts about each other. And once we got comfortable enough talking about those facts with each other, we got to the point where we would talk about our feelings about things. How many kids do you want to have? How did you feel about growing up and, um, and, and the way that you were raised and the places that you lived? How did you feel about those things? How did, how did you feel about that, uh, that thing that happened at work last week? Because we had built that friendship and we were to the place where we felt comfortable enough sharing those feelings with each other. And see, what's happened in our marriages when they get to this point where, we're, where our spouse has shut down from us is we, 
automatically start in with the feelings. Why don't you love me anymore? Why have you disconnected from me? What have I done to make you feel this way? What's going on that's made you feel this way? And if they don't feel comfortable enough talking at all, then they're not going to feel comfortable enough to talk about their feelings. See, what they really want to know is that we can be trusted with their facts, that they can share a fact about their life with us, like, how was your day yesterday? And when they respond with us, and maybe it's something short, it was okay, great. Well, anytime, you know, anytime you want to talk about it, I'm here. But if we keep pushing, how was your day yesterday? It was fine. Is that all you're going to tell me? Are you not going to tell me more? Why can't we talk about more? Then the next time we ask, how was your day yesterday? Probably very likely to not get any kind of response because they don't want to be badgered. So what we want to do in this step three is to focus on the friendship. Focus on what it was like when you first started dating. What were the kind of things that you talked about? How did you get to know each other to begin with? My husband and I played something called the question game. And we would just go back and forth asking questions all the time. The craziest questions. And I know that probably your marriage is not in a place right now where you can start playing the question game. But just start by asking questions. Questions that are easy to share answers to. Questions like, how was your day? How is work going? Did, have you eaten anywhere great lately? You know, I'm looking, have you seen any good movies? Questions that just bring out fact-based responses. Once people feel good about sharing facts, then they can start sharing more feelings. Once you start asking, how was work today to your spouse enough? And just that simple question, you don't push anymore. If they don't give much of an answer, you don't push. But if they do start giving more of an answer, at that point, you can say, hmm, do you want to tell me more about that? When they start inviting you into their life a little bit more, it gives you that opening and that lead in to be able to ask more questions, to be able to get to talk more at that point. Perhaps the most important thing to remember is to take this slow. Don't expect to implement all of these things in the next 48 hours. And, you know, by Friday or Saturday, your marriage is going to be completely better. And it's like that magic pill and you can move on from there. Unfortunately, that's not the way that this is going to go. This is a marathon. This takes days, weeks, months of implementing these things of not pushing your spouse to open up to you, of focusing on the friendship. And there's so much more that goes into this. But when we just try and boil it down and focus on the top three things to focus on, these are the three things that we can at least start with. But there's so much more that goes into this. And there's so many other things to focus on, like, well, what do I do if what they start telling me is something I don't like to hear? Does that mean that I should put up with it? If they keep telling me that they're in love with someone else and they want out of the marriage, then am I just supposed to continue to live in a marriage where my spouse is having an affair and that's supposed to be okay? The answer is no, but I also don't have the time or the space in this webinar to tell you exactly how to do that either, which is why we have different things like our online course, the Save My Marriage course, for example, which uh, is that 10 week course, which you get lifetime access to, but the material is 10 weeks long to be able to go through it. And it comes with weekly group coaching calls where we talk about things like this and we answer specific questions. So you can see how this starts working in the lives of real people. And it's with myself and Dr. Joe Beam and some of our other marriage helper certified people where we will talk to you about those things. And you get a secret Facebook group that you can be a part of that's full of other people who are implementing this in their marriage too. And so the guidance you get from them is just steps and leaps and bounds above what you might get from an open Facebook group or from people who just haven't really done anything to try and work on their marriage. They just like to uh, to vent about it and to do the wrong things. And that's the last thing that you want to start doing in your marriage. And so that's something we have available. And we even have a special going right now where If you sign up over the next couple of days, you get a 
a complimentary personal coaching session with one of our marriage helper coaches, which is $150, but you get that complimentary if you register for the Save My Marriage course in the next few days, which I'll include in the email. But some more tidbits of info to remember and things that we try and teach as our foundations at Marriage Helper is to be strong, to be calm, and to be gentle. We want to be strong when we're when we're talking to our spouse. We many times our spouse might try and um, the way that they react to us might be very angry. It might be very much trying to get into a fight. But we have that choice that we have to make when our spouse responds to us in a way that we feel like might be coming to a fight to to be strong and to not fight back, to be calm, to be gentle, to implement all of these things in our voice and our conversation in the way that we respond to the things that our spouse says to us or the way we respond when our spouse doesn't respond to things from us. It's okay to let your spouse know that you want the marriage to work out eventually. And you can do that without seeming desperate. There's a complete difference in saying to your spouse, I'll die without you. If you leave me, what are you going to do to our children? If you leave, what's going to happen to our future? Is this really what you want to do? There's a difference in saying that versus I still love you and I still want to make this marriage work. And just leaving it at that. Can you see the difference in that? Can you see the way that it can be interpreted interpreted differently? But you're still saying the same thing, that you want to save marriage and you're in this for the long, long haul. Make a plan to change yourself. Again, this is something that this webinar isn't exactly about, but if you realize like maybe there is something that I was doing, there's something that I've been saying to my spouse or reacting to my spouse when they come home or when we talk on the phone and I just shut them down. If they are saying something I don't like to hear, then I just am really good at making them shut down. If that's what's going on, then it might be that we just might need to start changing the way we react to things. One of my favorite stories of a couple that we've worked with is a couple where this, um, where he was a businessman and he was the president of the company that he owned and his wife was not involved in that company with him, but the husband hired a new secretary and they started spending a lot of time together as they would drive from appointment to appointment. The secretary would go with him and things were not going so well at home because whenever the husband would try and talk to the wife about his day, or about work, or about the things that were going on, then the wife would say things like, "This, I don't care. <laughs> I, do you, you aren't even asking me about my day. I don't care about what you have to say about yours. Can't you just listen to me for once in a while? But the husband was trying to open up with his wife, but it just wasn't happening. So he did find someone who would listen to him, when his secretary would be riding around with him and she would listen. And so he would continue to open up to her and eventually one thing led to another. And before you know it, he comes to his wife and says, I'm done. I don't love you anymore. I'm going to go be with this other person. Let me make sure you understand his reaction of someone, anyone's reaction of getting into an affair is never justified. It is always wrong. However, we can see how if there's something that's going on here, it could lead to a temptation here. Even if it is wrong, it happens. That's something in understanding why something like that could happen, understanding maybe what led to that vulnerability or that openness can help us to see what we need to do to change, to get them to come back, to to change the way the future of our marriage. And in this particular story, that's exactly what this woman began to do. At first, she did all the things you weren't supposed to do. She begged, she pleaded, she whined, she kicked him out, and so he left. But it got to the point where she said, clearly what I've been doing hasn't been working, so I'm ready to do something different. And that's when she came to us and she said, what do I do? And we said, okay, first you need to start working on yourself. You you need to focus on yourself physically, intellectually, emotionally, and spiritually, something we at Marriage Helper call the pies, 
which again, don't have time to go into that in this webinar, but it's very important to start focusing on yourself as an individual. So start working on the pies and then whenever you do hear from him, implement these things, figure out how day was, how's work going. The things that he would try to open up with you about in the past, just ask those simple questions and just see what happens. So she did, and at first it didn't bear much fruit. He would just say fine, and that would be the end of the conversation. But over time, he ended up opening up just a little more, a little more, a little more. Till finally, one day, his, <laughs> he said, um, that he ended up saying to one of the people on our staff, as we were working with him, he ended up calling us and he said, I don't understand what's happened because my the two people who are my best friends in life are my lover, my affair partner, and my wife. Because she had allowed him to open up again, and now he was getting really confused as to what was going on. And of course, I'll just jump to the end of the story. Whenever he would tell her, you know, I, I, I understand that we've been married, and I understand that I love you, but I just really love this secretary even more. And she would respond to him by saying, I understand how you feel, and I accept the fact that you feel that way. And I hope someday you feel that way about me again. That response is a night and day different response than the response of, I can't believe that you love someone else. I can't believe you would do this to me. You're doing something wrong, which is true. And when we have those feelings, it's okay to have those feelings, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best way to communicate with our spouse. So maybe we need to make a plan to change the way we communicate the way that we think about things, working on our pies, working on our communication, which again are, are things that we talk about in the Save My Marriage course that I just don't have time to talk about here, but these are all important things to do and focus on regaining that foundation of friendship. Remember, you can control yourself. You cannot control your spouse. You can control the way that you respond. If your spouse starts into a conversation with you and it quickly starts turning into an argument, you can choose to not fight back. You can choose to say things like, I understand this is important to talk about, but maybe you and I should talk about it when we're both a little more calm. And don't expect you being calm to automatically make your spouse calm. Many times it's a psychological principle that if someone's used to a conversation escalating a certain way, that whenever the person changes something we call the dance whenever someone changes the way they respond and the conversation doesn't escalate the way it used to then they will actually get even more intense think about it in terms of children if your child is constantly wanting a cookie and you fight about it and you fight about it you tell them no you can't have the cookie talk to you your broccoli but he just starts whining and complaining and finally you give in then the child knows that that's the way that it's always going to go I'll go and ask for a cookie. My mom will say no. My dad will say no. But if I just throw this much of a fit, then I can get the cookie. So let's say one day you say, no more cookies. He's not going to have any more. Even when he asks for one, I'm just going to say no, and I'm going to stick to guns. If you're a parent out there, you know that if you say no, and if you continue to say no, then your child's just going to start screaming louder, and they're going to start pitching more of a fit. It's not going to stop them from wanting the cookie. They're going to escalate to try and get you to give in. And it's the same in any kind of conflict. So when we're going through how to communicate with our spouse, and if conflict is an issue that's happening, we know that we need to be strong, that we need to be calm, that we need to be gentle. But we also know that... <laughs> that it's not always going to work out that well, that it's just because we're doing that doesn't mean our spouse is going to respond in the same way. So we have to determine beforehand how we're going to react to things, that we're going to react with calmness and with gentleness and with love and everything that we do. And we're not going to attack our spouse or to beg or to plead or to whine. And so we make a resolve to do this and we get people in our lives to hold us accountable which is just like what we do in the Save My Marriage course with the secret Facebook group that you get. Now, some of you might be thinking, okay, we're separated, and we've talked a little bit about this, but instead of fabricating interaction, like calling your spouse when you don't really have anything to say, you just are 
calling. That typically doesn't work out well, again, like we said before, if your spouse isn't engaging in conversation back with you. So utilize the tools you have. Children, we've talked about before, if there's any mutual connection you have with family or with mutual friends, if there's something that you have that can keep you and your spouse talking, even if it's about something that has nothing to do with your marriage, then keep doing those things. Keep those ropes around and talk to your spouse about it when it is appropriate. Maybe it's the bills. Maybe it's your mortgage. Maybe it's taxes. It's, you know, yesterday was tax day. And so it's those things where you can use them to your benefit. Remember that if there is a if there is complete separation and there's no way to talk to your spouse and there's no way for other people to intercede and in getting your spouse to talk, then to take it one day at a time because every situation is unique. Just yesterday, one of our one of our client um, one of our um, team members here, her name is Amber. One of our team members here, she we were at a team meeting and she said, "I just heard from one of our members of the Save My Marriage course yesterday," and he said. I joined the Save My Marriage course. I wish I had done it way before we ended up separating, but I joined it a month or two into our separation. I literally have not had communication with my wife. Literally, there has been absolutely no communication for six months. And yesterday, when he contacted us, he said, yesterday I had to see her in court for the first time in six months. And I haven't talked to her at all. And he said, I know that because of the things that I've learned and because of the things that I've implemented that I made yesterday count. Even if it is the last time I see her, even if it is the only time that I have seen her in the past six months and I might not ever see her again, but I implemented the things I've learned and I was a different person. And I could tell that she saw it. She was confused. You could see it in her eyes and I wasn't reacting to her the way that I used to and she could tell things were different. And I know for a fact I made yesterday count. And all of us here at the office were just so excited and we were so happy for him. And we just couldn't be even any more proud because these are the things that matter. You start doing the things to make you better. You do it because it's the right thing to do. You do it because it's the best thing for you to do, no matter what happens going forward. You do it because it makes you a better communicator and it gives you better relationships, no matter what. But if anything works to bring your spouse back and to get that communication going and to get to where you can talk again, if anything works for that, then this does. Because we've seen it for thousands and thousands of people, especially the things we talk about in the Save My Marriage course. If you're interested in the Save My Marriage course or in our in-person workshop, which we have, which is called the Marriage Helper 911 workshop, I'm about to get to your questions that you have. I see a lot of them have come in. But if those are things you're interested in, we are here to help. And you can call us at 615-472-1161, and you can talk to real people. We have multiple people here that you can talk to that can answer your questions. But one of the biggest things to understand is that if you're trying to get your spouse to seek marriage help with you, and maybe some of you are interested and you want desperately to come to our workshop, which has a 77% success rate, it's saving marriages that are on the brink of divorce and a 100% success rate at saving marriages that are both of them are wanting to work on the marriage. Um, if that's where your relationship is right now, then great. But if you're one of those people who that's what you want to do, but you can't get your spouse to agree to go with you, the Save My Marriage course has helped one out of five people the last time that we did the study on it. It's probably more now, but it has helped so many people that go through that course to get their spouse to agree to go to the workshop with them, not because we talk about the workshop and the course, but because it changes the way that the person interacts who goes through this course. Me as a wife, if I went through this course, it would change me as a person in such a way that my husband couldn't help but notice a difference. And it's that that spark that gets your spouse to re-engage with you. And that's exactly why we created this course. And we have 100% credit towards the Marriage Helper Workshop. So even if you pay the $399 for it today or whatever it is, I think you um, get a discount if you call in and talk to one of our um, one of our representatives here. But if you do this, it's 100% credit towards the workshop because we 
this can actually help you save your marriage. We've seen, we've had people in the course, it has saved their marriage and they decide to never come to the workshop. Praise God, we're happy to help. But if this but this can help. I, this can help in many situations. It can help you get your spouse to re-engage with you. It can help you go to that next level. And ultimately, we'd love to meet you in person. We'd love to meet you here in Nashville. But whatever happens, we're here to help. So I'm going to go through some of these question and answers that, that people have been bringing in for the, for the next 10 or 15 minutes before we end the call. Um, and I'm going to go through the ones that have a... That, that have to do with the subject that we've been talk to, talking about. Um, one of the things, one of the questions says, the one thing I struggle with is here at Marriage Helper is we pretty much take, we pretty much make it known that we are standing and fighting for our marriage, but then so many others say you have to make yourself no longer available or they feel no reason to change. So I believe what this question is talking about is other people, like maybe other people who are um, providing help for marriages and different things like that, they basically say, well, if your spouse feels like you are always going to be there, then they're never going to want them back. Because if there's something that's always available, then what's the reason to make a change now and to try and save it now? So first of all, I understand the Again, the concept, like it sounds really great in theory, but we've had people in one of our Facebook groups and they said, I did that. You know, I listened to that advice and I did that. And I actually, you know, I told my husband or my wife, I don't remember if it was a man or a woman, but I told my spouse that I was going to start doing other things and focusing on other people and even dating some more. And it didn't work the way they thought it would. In fact, their spouse said, well, if, if you're not in it and I'm not in it, then there's really no reason for us to keep working on this. So I'm just going to continue on in my affair or continue on doing something else. See, what that is at its core is manipulation. If you're saying to your spouse, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm moving on, I'm going to do something else in hopes of getting them to change, then you're trying to manipulate them into changing, which typically backfires and doesn't work. What we teach at Marriage Helper is more of a, a, a truthful, holistic response to it where we're saying, I would love for you to come back to the marriage because I love you. I want to make this work and I'm committed, but I'm also not dependent on you right now. And so the things that we teach, especially in the Save My Marriage course, is how to become that healthy, whole, independent person where you are right now. As, as your own person, when you focus on your pies, when you focus on becoming the best that you can be physically, intellectually, emotionally, and spiritually, your spouse begins to see that you are able to handle yourself in this world without them, even though you're not going out and dating other people and there's not necessarily something going on to where, um, to where they feel like you're about to leave and give up, but you're working on yourself and they can start seeing a change within you because Really what people want to know is that they can come back to a relationship and it can be better than what they had before. And so that's the things that we teach. And that's the things that we say, if anything works and works well, this will, because you're not using any type of techniques or anything like that. <clears throat> you're working on yourself and you're starting by working on yourself. And that brings your spouse back around which then can lead to that next part of changing the behaviors in your spouse need to be changed and, and different things like that. But we don't even focus on that yet when we first start focusing on working on ourselves and take a quick drink of water. I see some people coming or some people said, my wife told me control was our problem. If control is your problem, you're not alone. <laughs> we many marriages, as I said before, it's the silent killer of many marriages. And one of the things you can do is go to your Y O U R dot marriage helper dot com slash control. Just the word control. Y O U R dot marriage helper dot com slash control. And you can download our free ebooks on control. And there's an assessment in there that you can take to assess if you have been controlling, assess how controlling uh, you really are. Again, we have podcasts that have been done on it. If you follow us on Marriage Radio at iTunes or at Google or uh, yes, Google Play, we've done recent podcasts on both of those things. 
a podcast for the person who feels controlled and a podcast for the person who is the controlling person. So if you feel like that is your issue and you've identified it, start by working on fixing that. Some other questions that we have is, um, one of the first things I learned during my crisis is that I cannot control my wife. I can only control myself and my own responses. That is a foundational concept. Absolutely. I'm at the completely, completely agree with that. Um, someone else said, I think all of these three are the reasons that my marriage is struggling. The personal issues, the relationship issues, and the external issues. And it very well could be, again, that it's the combination of those things. One of the things, one of the weeks of the Save My Marriage course that we talk about is um, the reason behind the statement. So your spouse says that they want to leave, but what is the reason behind that? And we help you digest and, um, and dissect what that real reason behind it could be when your spouse says things like that. If your spouse isn't talking to you and you aren't sure why, what kind of questions can I ask him to learn why? So again, that's a great question. And we don't want to start in to the conversations with our husbands or with our wives by saying, why are you not talking to me? Because it's a very defensive question. It can, and what I mean by defensive question is that it's easy for someone to get defensive back to you when they are asked a question like that. Because basically what you're saying is, what you're doing is wrong, or I don't like what you're doing. So explain to me what you're doing. And people might not be able to answer a question like that because they might not even know. Our spouses might not even know completely why they're not communicating with us with us anymore. So questions to ask, again, start with fact-based questions. Things like, how was your day? Things like that. If you want to ask a question about the relationship, maybe asking a question like, if it's appropriate, if your spouse is gone and not talking to you. This is not the appropriate question to ask right now. But if you are living together and you're in the same house and you and you communicate to some extent on a regular basis, then maybe asking a question like, hey, I realized recently that I've probably done some things that have been hurtful in our marriage. And I'm trying to figure out what those are. Um, is there anything that you feel that I've done that I could perhaps do better in the future? But you have to be Willing to hear the answer to that is kind of the flip side of that. So it's one of those double edged swords where if you ask it too soon, the response could be very hurtful back. But if your spouse honestly feels like you're asking it because you're wanting to change, because you're wanting to do things different and they can respond in a way back to you that's not going to be hurtful or retaliating, but give you helpful information. And that's another great way to start. Someone said, um, I've been pushing quite a bit lately. What would be a good strategy to dial it back and to contact her in a more positive way? So when we're talking about stopping our pushing behaviors, the best thing to do first is to stop the pushing behaviors and not to tell our spouse that we're stopping the pushing behaviors. So we don't send them a text and say, hey, I'm no longer going to be begging or whining or pleading because that's another way of us trying to get our spouse's attention and, and in one way it is still a pushing behavior. But instead saying, if there's a room for an apology, then do that. If there's room and you feel like it would be helpful and not hurtful to say, I realize that I've been acting in a way I shouldn't and I'm sorry and I won't do it anymore, then leave it at that. But don't expect a response or a reply and don't do it to get a response or a reply. But if you feel like maybe there's an apology that needs, needs to be made, you can make it. But otherwise, you just stop doing those behaviors. And instead, the things that you replace it with are, first of all, focus on you. Focus on getting yourself physically, intellectually, emotionally, and spiritually to the place where you need to be. Because if you are focusing so much on your marriage, and that's all that's consuming your thoughts, then you're more likely to want to do these pushing behaviors because that's that's all you're thinking about. That's all, that's all you're thinking about. But when you start focusing on things like yourself, making yourself healthy, making yourself better, and it's not, you're not letting the problems in your marriage completely consume your mind, then that will make a big difference in well, as well. Um, if your spouse says that you are doing nothing wrong now, you have in the past that you've changed, but they just don't love you anymore. She, uh, my spouse said she just wants to be left alone for a while then decide what she wants to do. Meanwhile, we're not talking much and we're sleeping in separate rooms. So what do I do? 
Do I just wait it out or do I give a date by which she should dis re-engage? If your spouse is wanting and has asked for space, a lot of times what that means is I don't want to talk. I don't want to think about our marriage. I don't want to talk about our relationship issues because every time we do, it is a bad situation. We fight. We don't get anywhere. It's always worse. And so what I would say, if I were you, would be that if you're, especially if you're still living together, even if you're leave, living in separate rooms, again, you focus on that friendship. You focus on how was your day today, and you just let her talk about whatever, and don't talk about the marriage. Don't talk about your relationship problems. Don't talk about things that are stressful. Just talk about things that are innocuous, things that are probably not going to get any kind of emotional response like, hey, did you see that movie last night? Or can you believe that whatever might be in the news is always a great talking point, <laughs> which is pretty much. Anyway, so, <laughs> you know, using something to just talk about things other than your relationship. And at this point, no, I would not give a date to re-engage because when you put an ultimatum in front of someone, especially when things aren't going well, it just, again, continues to push them away. Someone says, we're divorced. Is there anything I can do to get that friendship back? We have people who are in the Save My Marriage course and who come to our workshop who have been divorced. One couple who had been divorced 10 years. Yes, there's absolutely a way to get your marriage back and get that friendship back after a divorce. It's easier if you have kids together because, again, you have something that's keeping in common with you. But even, even if you don't, Implementing these things can still help. Focusing on those questions that aren't going to bring about bad feelings and different things like that are huge in making change. Um, and going back again through these questions, we're, I'm going to take just a couple more before we end it. And... Some of them are really long, so it's hard to read them. Someone says, um, I'm separated from my husband since last year. He's out of the house. What do I do if he will talk to me? We will only talk through the phone or Facebook mes messenger. Should I text him to wish him a great day at work? So if I read this right and you're saying that he will talk to you, but it's only through the phone or Facebook messenger, then if it were I, I probably wouldn't send a message just saying, hey, hope you had a great, hope you have a great day today. First of all, it, it's not a question. So it doesn't initiate a response. I could read, I get text messages like that all day on my phone. My husband sends me memes of obese animals and he finds it very funny. So he sends those to me and I look at it and I laugh, but he didn't ask me a question, so I don't respond. It's the same here. If you're not asking a question, like at the end of the day, hey, um, just thinking about you, how was your day today? Then then there's a reason to respond. Again, we don't really like to encourage people to use Facebook Messenger or to text because it can, it, it's just not as personal. And there's things that people can read into text messages that if they were to hear your voice on the phone, that it would be different. But, um, you know, that's, if that's what you have, then use it to your advantage. But again, that doesn't mean you Facebook them every day. And that doesn't mean you text them every day. If there's something going on, maybe if they have a favorite sports team and their sports team won a game, you text and you're like, hey, I saw that the Red Sox won. So um, I know you, uh, I'm sure you're happy about that. Are you having a good day? That, that's one way to do it. I'm, I don't know anything about baseball, but I think Red Sox are a team. So <laughs> those are the different things that you can do, even if your spouse is not willing to talk to you on the phone. There's still a way to do it. One person, here's one of my favorite stories, and this is what we'll end with, but one person, um, she was in the Save My Marriage course, they came through the workshop, and, and her spouse was just very, still very disengaged from her. And so it was around Christmas time, and they didn't have any kids. They didn't have a reason to continue talking to each other, but they, uh, so they didn't. Like there, would, there was months that went by that they weren't talking to each other because they didn't have a good reason to talk to each other. But it was around Christmas time and she started cleaning out the attic and she found one of his Christmas ornaments of his favorite team. And she thought, you know, I think he would really like to have this. And so she just put
put it in a box and she just wrote a quick little letter, nothing long or drawn out or emotional or anything like that, but just, hey, found this and I thought you would like it and sent it to her. And that's a great thing to do. If there's, like, it's perfect because there was nothing else to get them to talk, but she did a nice gesture. She didn't have to do it, but she did a nice gesture. She wasn't expecting anything back, but it's something that could facilitate conversation that meant something, not something just, uh, hey, talk to me. Hey, I, I'm thinking about you today. Not that it wasn't constant of anything like that, but it was something that mattered and something that made a difference. I'm gonna send out an email with all of the information we've talked about. It's been absolutely awesome. We'd love to have you in the Save My Marriage course. We'd love to have you in our workshop. And if nothing else, we'd love to have you listening to our podcast where we talk about all so many things and it's so much help. And we have articles, Facebook pages, get involved with what we're doing. Um, if, you if you join the Save My Marriage course in the next, I think it's three days, then you get a free coaching session, a personal coaching session. So it's you, it's one of our Marriage Helper Certified Coaches. You get that time together, I think it's 45 minutes, um, and they, they'll just go with you over your situation and they'll talk about how the course will help you and or they'll just talk to you about where to start in your own situation. We, we have never offered that before, but we're wanting to do this to help all of you. And that's $150, people pay it all the time. But if you join the course, you get that at no cost. And we have payment plans, whatever it takes to get you in this course, we want to have you in it. So give us a call at 615-472-1161 or uh, you know, go to marriagehelper.com slash save my marriage and get involved in the course. Come to one of our workshops. Remember, it's not it doesn't have to be an either or, but the Save My Marriage course is the best place for you to start if your spouse is disengaged and not communicating with you. I can't tell you the hundreds of people that have gone through the course and had success in this of getting their spouse to re-engage with them, of talking to their spouse again, of the amazing changes it makes. And so many of them say, if not all of them, they say, I wish I had done this first. I wish I had learned these things first. And we want to do whatever it takes to get you in that course. Whatever it takes, whatever your situation might be, let us know. We want you in it. We want to help you. It's our heart. We're going to save 10,000 marriages over the next five years. We'd love for you to be one of them. Let us know how we can help. And we'll see you next time. Have a great day.